everyone, it's day 129 of uh, spiritual healthcare. So welcome, welcome. It's good to see everybody. It was kind of a crazy week last week, so I was kind of absent from the uh, social media Facebook world because there was a lot of health crisis going on in uh, this neck of the woods. So anyway, those are mostly over and um, it's good to see everybody. Uh, good morning to all of you. It is uh, Wednesday morning, yet again, day 129. So it's good to see you guys. Uh, Ed says, happy birthday. Thank you so much. That was yesterday. Yesterday, um, it, was a, it was a pretty quiet birthday, needless to say, because uh, of everything going on and all the crazy restrictions and whatever so um yeah so it was a pretty quiet birthday but um it was uh fun nonetheless and um yeah so today is going to be really interesting on spiritual health care i've got uh some really great questions about cases and uh uh some gear questions too which is going to be really cool some uh some paranormal gear questions and, and whatnot which is awesome um and as I say, a really, really interesting case that I think you guys are going to dig. So uh, this will be really fun. Um, it's good to see everyone. I hope you guys are doing really, really well. Good morning to Des and to Dan and to Ed and to everybody that's logging in. It's nice to see you. Um, it, yeah, it's been a, a crazy last few weeks. Um, as I say, there's been like a bunch of health crises that kind of like fell in the family like one after the other. Um, so last week was just a no-go for me. I was too tired and <laughs> I was like, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, so it's, but it's good to be back and it's good to see you guys. Um, I had some really, really cool questions, um, regarding, uh, EMF meters, EMF meters, uh, K2 meters and, um, and whatnot. Uh, so we're going to talk about those today because there's a lot of misconceptions about electromagnetics, um, EMF meters, various EMF meters, whether it be K2 or whatever, um, how they work. Uh, cause man, I'm telling you probably 80% of the people out there don't know how the hell these, how the hell EMF meters actually work. And they all go by the television shows. Don't go by the TV shows. Don't, don't do that. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't use that as your point of reference. Okay? <laughs> it's, it's a bad idea. Um, so I'll explain that here in, in just a little bit. And as I say, I got a really interesting email. Um, about a very intriguing case and, uh, ultimately it's, it's, the, the roots of this case stem back to, um, you know, whether or not people move on or need to make amends and things like that. So we're going to talk about that because, of course, it's I think it's on a lot of people's minds. A lot of people are losing loved ones and stuff right now um, and what that all means. So we're going to talk about all that today. Uh, good morning, Sally. Nice to see you. It's nice to see everyone. Um, it is is good to, to be here. Our uh, production company just bought a uh, or a just invested in a, a stage line, which I'm really excited about. I'm hoping that we'll be able to bring live theater back here eventually to a uh, lovely, lovely province of Alberta. We'll see what happens. Um, so there's been a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, very, uh, yeah, it's been a very, very busy week. So let's dive into it. Let's get into this. We've got lots of people here. It's nice to see everyone. Um, wherever you're from, Introduce yourself if you're new. Put your uh, put your info in the comments. Say hi. This is a this is always so much fun to be here every every Wednesday. So um, so one of the first questions that I thought led into a really interesting discussion um, was from Dan, uh, and what he asked was so here we go. Not sure if quartz is supposed to trigger K2 meters or not. So K2 meters, guys, for those who don't know, this is not a K2, but um, is an is a electromagnetic field meter, and it's got little lights on the top, but it picks up elect electromagnetics. Um, last I knew, quartz did not contain any magnetic properties. Um, quartz pieces, uh, the quartz pieces he has are the size of small rocks, and a former investigator said if he used them in some sort of cleansing ritual. Um, to be share, to be to be fair, not sure what made me think to scan them with a K two, but I was surprised to see it actually the meter actually peg. Um, okay, so here's the thing with with electromagnetics qu quartz and and all sorts of things. So people often think that um, uh, electromagnetics, for instance, are only related to electrical fields in a property. Okay, like in a house, in a uh, you know, something that's man-made, right? Like something that's got wires in it, something, all that kind of thing. But here's the thing. So when quartz is under a lot of pressure, um, it can do a whole bunch of really, really 
bizarre things. Um, and quartz is something that actually does translate, it does, tr does transmit energy, but it doesn't do that unless you put that energy into it, right? So um, say, like, let's use the example of your, your watch, right? People that have quartz watch, things like that, it will actually, it, it creates its own, it, its own field. So um, a great example of this is the river valley actually here in Edmonton. So our river valley was actually old volcanic land way back in the day. Um, the, the Gettysburg battlefield has the same geological makeup where, uh, again, it used to be old, vol like anytime you get old volcanic land, the, od the odds of it being a quartz bed underneath um, is actually pretty high. So when we, we th when we think about old volcanic land, you kind of got to check for stuff like this. So if you've got something like a tri-field meter, for example, that is really built to register natural EMF, because um, electromagnetics come on a, a great big frequency, like it's a, it's a band basically, right? So certain meters are going to be more sensitive to certain frequencies than others. Um, so anyway, we would take, uh, say for example, a tri-field meter, take the tri-field meter down, and we would end up getting these really, really strange electromagnetic readings from our river valley. Um, the people at Gettysburg report the same thing, where it's just like in and out and up and down, and it just doesn't see, doesn't seem to make any sense. It's almost like a wandering electromagnetic field. Um, there's a, a, a ranch called Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. They have the same issues. Um, I don't know if they've discovered what's underneath it yet. Um, they have the same issues, but so anyway, long story short, um, you know, for the, the meter to peg over something like this, it's not actually that uncommon. Um, I, as I have seen it before, I've seen it in a lot of these, these areas that are, uh, uh, are laden with, with, uh, uh, quartz underneath the ground. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it, it does happen. Uh, you know, do I think it has anything to do with any sort of cleansing ritual? No. Um, it, it, you know, any sort of ritual like that is not going to affect a tri, a tri field K2 EMF meter of any sort at all. It just won't. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> so these, um, these meters to sort of take this conversation a little bit further. So electromagnetic field meters are a calibrated meter. They are calibrated to detect certain ranges of frequency. So when you guys see them on the TV shows and things like that, using these to do things like talk to ghosts and, and that kind of thing, this not, that's not how these things work. Okay. It's just like hands down straight up, you know, movie tricks aside, these do not work like that. So electromagnetic meter field meters, no matter what, no matter what you're dealing with are calibrated to read electromagnetic fields. Okay. And most of them, most of them, the K2 meter um, specifically is the, very rarely is it sensitive to anything other than like household appliances, uh, which I mean, it can be, I guess, sensitive to others, but um, usually they are, they are literally calibrated to read the electromagnetics in, in like wiring in, uh, uh, in your walls and the fridge and like, like stuff like that. So um, tri-field meters work better for, for things like uh, uh, outdoor use and stuff like that because their range is a little bit broader. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so one of the tricks that a lot of the TV shows will use to trick electromagnetic meters into, uh, looking like they're, they're spiking when they're talking to ghosts and things like this is what they'll do is somebody will actually either have a walkie talkie in their pocket or their cell phone, and they will have another person somewhere on set or whatever, actually send them a text message. Okay. And that text message will actually alert the phone, which makes the electromagnetic spike, which causes these to go off. I know it's super tricky, <laughs> but, but that's what happens. It doesn't take much to allow these things to spike. And when, you know, oftentimes people will think, well, my phone was off or, you know, like, or it was on do not disturb or whatever. These subtle spikes in things like phones, walkie talkies, anything like that will set off electromagnetic meters. So the odds of what you're seeing being like the real deal, pretty minimal. So yeah, hate to bust people's bubbles on EMF, but that's what it is. <laughs> so, so we got to be really, really careful about, about things like this now, granted. So here's, here's a, a, a rather interesting exception to the rule. So I was doing a case and this has been over the last couple of years now, um, working a case at an acreage that is um, 
south of Edmonton and it's it's huge acreage it's beautiful property and uh, they've had some really really cool stuff happening there like they've been seeing encounters of dogmen and uh, um, there's there's kind of a murder mystery that's all in wrapped up into this case um, there's a, a um, in, interesting entities in the in the property that move things around the kitchen all sorts of cool things um, so anyway the uh, the uh, the property itself is really a hotbed for activity. It's there all the time. And uh, there's stuff that goes on there all the time. So when we were walking around with, and it was with this electromagnetic field meter, um, they've got no lines under their property. They've got nothing. Um, they know where all the lines are. They renovated their property themselves. So they, they know kind of where everything is. And um, we had, we wandered around and watched the electromagnetic field meter, EMF meter spike. Um, randomly all of a sudden we couldn't figure out why um, it was it was really bizarre we were out in the middle of the bush out in the middle of nowhere um, but it seemed like there was a wandering electromagnetic energy that was just wandering through the, the property and we still don't know what it is we still have not tracked down what's causing this uh, but uh, it's it's come with some interesting things like the trees on the property are all bent and growing in, in very strange ways. And where these trees were growing in strange ways was typically where this would, would spike. So so it's really interesting. So anyway, the world of electromagnetics is fascinating uh, and whatnot, but it's, it's important, I think, to blow out some of the myths about electromagnetic field meters because the 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 shows often depict them like they're some sort of a ghost detector and that's just wrong it's just <laughs> straight up wrong we don't know what ghosts are made of we don't know what spirits are made of so therefore you cannot calibrate a meter to test for them right we, we can't um it, it just doesn't it just doesn't happen it doesn't it doesn't exist so uh, until we have an answer to that question we will never ever have any sort of ghost meter whatsoever but you never know so anyway um, on to, I wanted to, uh, hi Shadow, hello, and she says happy birthday too, thank you so much, and thank you Nancy for the happy birthday, I so appreciate that, um, yeah, it was my birthday yesterday guys, it was, but yeah, it was, it was a very quiet birthday, but it was, it was fine, um, so this is a really interesting case, so this came in, um, via email, and I thought it bared repeating, because I think it's got some really interesting, uh, points and merits that I, I think, a lot of you guys will, will draw from and make use of. <clears throat> so it's a really interesting story, and I'm going to read this to you guys so you can get, get a beat on this and talk about it too. Um, so this fellow wrote in, he said, I have a son whose mother ran off with him when he was two. I found them over Facebook after about 15 years of looking. Um, August 12th, this lady passed away um, at the same day I was at my medical caseworker's office when I stepped to his office I began having feelings of not being able to breathe like I was trapped I felt trapped and dying three hours after I left his office I got texts from my son uh, and godfather that she had passed away that morning um, this was his first Thanksgiving without his mom and his first Thanksgiving with me and my family uh, when when we were talking and I told him about the feelings, waking up at the same time in the middle of the night, we've heard our names and other miscellaneous words. When we spent the night uh, on Thanksgiving, we both slept through the entire night. Uh, I believe that Michelle is trying to make amends and can't move on. There are a few of us that feel that she might be trapped here and has not moved on. Uh, could this be an elemental playing with our emotional and spiritual wounds? So I think this is a really, really interesting case. Um, and I wanted to bring it up be with, with everybody because I think it's, it speaks volumes as to where a lot of people are right now and a lot of questions that people are having about what is going on, like what is going on when their loved one passes away and they didn't get to say goodbye because there's a lot of people, for example, that cannot go visit their loved ones in the hospital. I was in that position here in the last few days or the last few weeks where my partner ended up in the hospital and I couldn't go visit. I couldn't go see him, even though neither of us were ill with COVID-19. Um, so this is, but this has become a, a, a major issue. What, what happens when? So the first thing I would say about this case is obviously the, you know, the person who wrote in here is, is extremely sensitive to, uh, and, and intuitive enough to pick up on the fact that something is up. Something is, something is seriously going on. Um, there's probably a little bit of mediumship ability involved in this. Um, 
where you've got someone who has sort of received the thought forms of something that is that is is currently currently going on. There's been a, there's an, a case like this uh, in the upcoming season of Haunted Hospitals uh, in season in season three that you guys are going to see, which is one of the reasons why I think this case is uh, really relevant right now. Um, so anyway, apart from that, I think the, the major part that I want to touch on, because because that type of thing happens very frequently, will people pick up on um, either, you know, other people's emotions or, or the essence of something that's going on um, in the environment, and, and we kind of pick up on those thought forms or emotions, which is, is something that's actually quite common. Uh, so I think the the, the troubling part about this is the idea that has sort of spun around society that, you know, these people are are feeling guilty or feeling trapped and can't move on or can't go anywhere or are, you know, they can't they can't move on until they they make amends. And that's just simply not the case. It's just not true. Um, and it's it's be, it's come down through our culture, I think, in in a lot of a lot of ways, both with with some of the the television shows as well as uh, just throughout folklore there's a lot of that uh, the idea of you know vampires the idea of zombies um, unfortunately religion has played a large chunk of, of issues with this where um, uh, you know if you if you don't pay the church so much money then they won't move your loved one on this kind of thing um, psychics uh, like uh, scammy psychics will 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 pull this as well you know if you don't pay me so much money then they'll be you know, then we have to, um, you know, then that, that person's going to be stuck in your house or, or something like this. So it's got a lot of toxic roots, this, this storyline that people are, are, that people perpetuate. And then you get somebody who actually has had something really tragic happen to them and like, like these people, and they're now stuck with this, you know, this worry, this, this concern that this is, this is what's going on. And if we if we take a look back in throughout parapsychology history and parapsychological history, we can easily see the fact that this just doesn't seem to be the case. Um, there's a lot of uh, there there's been a lot of research done in terms of uh, you know connection on, and communicating with uh, uh, people after death and things and things like that. Um, but never have I ever read an academic paper, and I'm not talking about you know, people running around with, with ghost meters. I'm talking about people who have literally committed their lives to studying parapsychology. I have not read a academic paper ever where somebody has said these people get stuck here and they need our help to move over. Ever. It hasn't happened. Um, and I remember uh, there was about, it was about a year or two ago that I ended up getting into a bit of an argument with one, uh, with a podcast host about this because, um, he very much had this filter that that's that was the case and uh um and ultimately when you put that that layer i almost look at it like like if you have a map of stars and you have a bunch of you know it looks very random right and then you take a con map of the constellations and you lay that over top suddenly the stars look a little bit less random and i think sometimes people will have experiences where it really does seem like like they have an interaction with a negative entity or something like that and it really does seem like okay it must be that person they start to connect the dots where there maybe isn't an actual drawing there is an actual pattern um so it's it's really interesting so shadow saying how can a person prove or disprove a spirit is not moving on so that's a really good question um and a lot of the information has come through uh come through places like uh the Winbridge institute and things like that with with mediums that have been scientifically tested um it just throughout our experience just through like because i've been doing this for 20 years um i've never run into a case where i've had a, a family member that has that has just been been trapped or stuck um you know it just doesn't seem to be something that is 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 grounded in any sort of actual case history um so you know and i think we have to remember too that this is the universal energy universal energy has been around since the dawn of time so if they needed our help that would have happened a really long time ago i, I guarantee you they're not 
you know, a trillion cavemen that are stuck going, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, that, that was very much a religious, it, it has its, has its basis in religion. So I think we just have to use common sense with a lot of this where, you know, you've got energy that cannot be created or destroyed. It is, you know, constantly moving in and out of form. And we have to remember that it's, it's, it does its own thing. It's, it's got its own, you know, it's, it's got its own, uh, uh, you know, way of way of being and way of operating in the world, both scientifically and spiritually. So, um, you know, we just have to. I think we just have to really use a lot of common sense with this, um, and and understand where it started because it, it didn't start, you know, way back in the time of, you know, whatever. It, like this is this is this storytelling about about people getting stuck is not a it's not an old an old thing per se. Um, and Des is saying, you know, it always bothered me. I never understand why a spirit would be stuck to a place or a home. Yeah, it just, it just really doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, Shadow is asking, um, do you think spirits may hesitate before moving on? I think some spirits definitely stick around to, um, you know, to, to talk to loved ones, to make an appearance. Um, there's plenty of cases in research where people have uh, talked about, um, uh, seeing like what they call a crisis spirit, which is somebody who passes away and then shows up at the end of their bed or something like that. And they see them to say goodbye right before they move on. Uh, stuff like that happens all the time. Um, they, you know, they, they come in visitation very frequently happens all the time. Um, you know, but, but I think to say that, that the energy that creates worlds is stuck somewhere is just that seems very illogical to me but it does serve a very good financial purpose for a lot of <laughs> for a lot of people so um so shadows asking so they pause but they're not stuck yeah i think that's a really that's a really great way of of putting it like you know and and i think we have to remember that we get visitations from these 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 you know, energies very constantly. It's just, it's constantly happening. Um, one of the best analogies I think I ever heard was, um, you know, people don't die. They just step into the next room. And I think, I think we have it in our heads that there is this great big gap that happens. There's this great big transitional gap between us and this, some other world somewhere. And, and that's just simply doesn't seem to be the case either. Um, you know, the, the connection that we have with them is not in some other you know, some other existence. We, we have access to these people constantly. Um, it was, it was really, really interesting. Sometimes the ego, I think pieces of the ego get left behind. I think, um, uh, but I really do think that the, the unfinished business is usually with people. Um, we, we as human beings struggle with the intangibility of, of the, of a body without a, without a, a brain to translate consciousness and we'll kind of go kind of going down the rabbit hole a little bit with this but um i think when I, I think that the the ultimate gap really is us closing the gap between grief and joy and when we're able to close the gap between grief and joy we end up back in connection with with these with with these individuals um so i think I, I, I think, you know, there's a transition period from what I've, from what I've read and understood from quite a few different spirits, uh, over the years, um, throughout people's works, such as the Winbridge Institute or with, um, uh, uh my great, great grandfather's work, for instance, um, he describes a period of rest. Uh, once, once people make that transition, there's a period of rest for them to acclimatize to non-physical existence again. Um, so it's, it's interesting depending on, on where you're reading and, and who you're sort of pulling the information from. But, um, I think at the end of the day, in my experience, I've, I've never ever, as they run into a, a study or a case in, in, in my books where, where there's somebody that literally cannot, cannot move or, or something like that. Everybody's got the, the free will to do it. Um, I've definitely seen cases where, um, uh, spirits are very protective. They want to, they, they stick around the family. They hang around the family. They're, um, they often return to places they really love. Um, they come back to places that they really enjoyed being and, um, uh, spend quite a bit of time there. Um, that's, that's been reported quite often. Sometimes I, th I think the, uh, one of the reasons why I think people struggle with the idea of, of spirits being stuck, 
um, is the phenomenon of residual energy. So I know I've talked about residual energy before. For those of you guys who are new to that concept, it's the idea that um, uh, the, the environment, and this actually has to do with electromagnetics, so kind of going back to the first conversation, um, the idea that electromagnetics in the environment are, is actually able to somehow record um, incidents, they, uh, smells, sights, sounds, images, and things like that. And oftentimes with residual energy, because you're, you're not dealing with something that's conscious, you're dealing with something that is literally a, an image or a sound or a smell that's just replaying like a needle on a phonograph in the environment. I think uh, sometimes people mistake that for an entity also that's being stuck, right? And uh, I think that's that's a big a big misconception as well. They see an event repeating, or they see an apparition, or what they think is an apparition. It's an image that's repeating again and again and again and again. Um, uh, and they they think, oh, that person's conscious and they're stuck here, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And and that's it's a completely different phenomenon. It's not the same thing. Um, Callie, hi Callie. Um, she is asking, um, have you seen any studies about dream walking? Um, has having meaningful uh, working dreams with those who've passed? Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I can't name any studies like off the top of my head about this, um, but they're out there. If you go to, I'll send you the link after I'm done this. Um, the Sci Encyclopedia. Uh, there's there's work and stuff like that in. in uh, there's there's papers in there about it. Um, and yeah, I'll, as I say, I'll send you the link after this. Um, but yeah, and uh, and I think I I like I've had a lot of dreams where like I run into to Steph, who's my business partner that passed away. Um, I've had some some dreams where uh, like she and I have been been doing something together, um, and it there there's been a quite a few of those that definitely have not felt like dreams, but they felt like encounters. And I, I think there's I, I think there's some access there to to the non physical world in in that dream space. Um, so Sally was asking. I was talking to my dad the other day. I have an old level uh, old level stick of his, and was showing it to a contractor uh, who was doing some work at my house. When all of a sudden we both got the chills. I would like to say that it was my dad letting me know he was there. Yeah, you know. And here's the here's the interesting thing. You know, with with that, I think. I think people are always expecting non-physical communication to come in the form of this apparition that is just, that just shows up um, and that they're supposed to get this like great big, you know, glowing person that comes down and tells them they're okay. And, and we miss out on the time, the little communications that happen. Um, I, I think we know when it's, you know, when it's that person, the, the chills that you feel, I've, I felt those too. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think there, there's absolutely something, there's something to that. Um, we, we know, I think instinctually, you know, when, when that person's around, when they're not around and the universe, let me tell you, it will bend over backwards to, to make these encounters happen. It, it's, it's really incredible. And really the only thing that holds us apart from those encounters are the people are, are us. It's us. It's, it's not them. Um, it, it's our own negative beliefs, our own negative self-talk. It's our own negative, you know, just, just garbage that's going on. It re really is. Um, you know, or, or we dismiss it. We, you know, we shuck it off or we're not in emotional range to receive it. You know, we're still stuck in grief. Get a lot of questions from people who are grieving that say, you know, where is so-and-so? I thought I'd have a, a, a communication with them. And then they get really angry because someone maybe who wasn't as close to them gets a, a visitation or something like that. And they're going, why wasn't it me? Why wasn't it me? And ultimately the reason why it's not them is because they just have more resistance around the idea, uh, around the, the grief process than the person who maybe didn't care as much. Um, you know, they're not as tied up in grief. They can get to joy a little bit easier and therefore they're in, in better range of that person. Um, so it's, it, it's, which sucks because <laughs> say it's, it's usually of course the people that want the, the, uh, you know, the occurrence and whatever that, that end up not getting it because they're just holding themselves apart from it. Um, so Nancy was asking, what about when you dream and something, or dream something and then it happens, but not exactly like it did in your dreams? Yeah. So that's a, that's a really, really, really great question. Um, I think, I think dreams for, for me, from my interpretation of them, I think are a reflection of your vibrational state. I don't think they're necessarily exact premonitions. 
Um, but I think they are reflective of the emotional and vibrational state that you've got going on. Uh, I think dreams are a really great way of understanding your vibrational habit at the time. So if you have, you know, if you're having dreams about like panic, like panic situations, or you're having dreams about, you know, fearful situations, or, you know, and it, sometimes they make sense, sometimes they don't. Um, and then you've got something that of course manifests in your life um, that, you know, is fearful or anything like that. I, I think a dream is almost in a, in a way like a, like a negative entity in a, in a, in a, in a way um, where they're kind of emotional indicators where, you know, you don't necessarily get exactly what you're, what you've got in your head, but you get the essence of it. Um, and I think dreams are, are, are really, are fascinating, uh, uh, indicators, but I don't think they're necessarily premonitions in a way that like, or, or very rarely anyway, they're, they're premonitions of an exact event happening. Um, but I think they are an indicator of like, Hey, you know what, if I'm having a nasty dream, I, I got something I got to clean up because, and, and I, and I have the opportunity to clean it up before it actually manifests. So that's always a, that's always a plus as well. Um, and Nancy was saying she had an epiphany, um, that all she could do was forgive him a week and a half later. I got a call from a detective letting, letting me know that my father was found dead. Yeah. And I, I think it, that's a, thank you for sharing that by the way, cause it's such a powerful story. Um, I think, I think sometimes as you know, as I was saying before, non-physical has a really great way of kind of getting, ringing stuff home in dreams. Um, and forgiveness is such a powerful, powerful thing. It's such a powerful word, um, and powerful state of action. And, and most people just, they screw up the meaning of forgiveness completely because it really has, it doesn't have a damn thing to do with, um, uh, you know, the other person or saying what the other person did was okay. It really has to do with letting go and being willing to let go of the vibration of whatever you've got going on around that individual or around that person. It doesn't mean you have to like them. It doesn't mean you have to be okay with them. It doesn't mean it like you don't got to do that. It's, it just means letting go of the vibration of hoping that the past could be any different. It really is. It's letting, it's letting that go. Um, shadow is saying, um, I think sometimes dreams are like a tuning fork that can reveal an upcoming event or situation if we're open enough. Yeah. Tuning, that's a great example. Um, that's a really great example, shadow. I think the idea of it being a tuning fork, it's a really great analogy. And, um, I think when you've got, again, it's, it's, it's a way of, you know, going back to what I was saying before, it's a way of understanding that, that this stuff our reality, our coming reality, everything really does happen in the now. It really does happen all at once in the now. And our ability to foresee it really doesn't necessarily have to do with, you know, being able to be psychic or, or considering ourselves psychic or anything like that. It's really an understanding of the fact that we get to create whatever we want to go forward, going forward. We, we get to create that. So if we get to create that, and we get these little previews. Albert Einstein once said, um, you know, the imagination is the preview of coming attractions. And if the imagination is the preview of coming attractions and dreams are kind of a window into that, that's pretty cool. You know, we get these little glimpses every once in a while, um, you know, and if what you're imagining is terrible and, and awful and, you know, and you, you use your mind towards worry all the time and things like that, you know, it's going to start to manifest. And I think dreams fall into that same category. A dream is a manifestation. A thought is a manifestation, right? So the more that we think about something, the more that we put focus into something, the more all of this, you know, starts to accumulate, the more we start dreaming about it, the more we get dreams that are the essence of what we're thinking about. Um, you know, and I think when we're in tune and we're doing well and we're, you know, up that emotional scale to, to a good place, we end up tuning into some, some previews that are pretty amazing. They're pretty cool. Um, you know, and then if we're on the other end of that scale, we, we tune into the previews that are, are not so fun. Uh, I think it was, I don't think it was the other week, but it was, it was a couple of weeks ago, at least on, um, on spiritual healthcare here, we were talking about tarot. Um, and I, I had been mentioning that, uh, uh, Stephanie and I, we did a number of experiments into tarot. It was really quite interesting, uh, and cardamancy and all that stuff. And, uh, what we discovered was something really intriguing. We would have 
um, we, we take, we had a multiple tarot decks. We had two or three of them. And what we would do is we'd get ourselves into a, a vibrational state. We'd pick something, uh, whether it be, you know, something negative, something positive, you know, whatever, but we'd feel that out. And then we would shuffle the cards and we'd do the reading. We'd put the cards on the table. And what was so fascinating, and we probably did this like in one sitting, we do, you know, 40 some odd readings with all with the different decks. And what was so interesting was that every single time the readings would come out reflective of the vibrational state that we'd gotten ourselves into every single time. And as soon as we changed it, as soon as we thought, okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to deliberately move our way up the emotional scale. We're going to get some to a place that's really happy. We'd put the cards back out on the table and instantly they would be reflective of the emotional state. And it, you know, 40 readings later, you get the same thing over and over and over and over again. Um, but we realized that, you know, there was, there was influence that was going on there and, and it wasn't how we were reading it. Um, it wasn't, uh, you know, how we were reading the descriptions, the descriptions would, would definitely, they would, they would change based, the, the entire reading would change its, its, in, its state. And it was, it was really fascinating. And, uh, I, you know, I think when we, when we get these negative dreams or we get these negative premonitions and things like that, I think we have to be able to remember that it really is something that, you know what, okay, I got this indicator, I got this preview of this coming attraction, I might not like it, I don't like it, what do I have to do? What is it telling me to do to clean this up so I get a different probability? Um, I think it was the last class, we were, we were talking about probabilities and uh, the analogy that I, that I used, which I think is still awesome, uh, it was from a, a philosopher by the name of Jesse Elder, and he described it as, as if you were sitting in a house with thousands of rooms and each room was a probability. And the room that you were sitting in, depending on the room that you ended up sitting in, depended on the room you focused on. So if you were focused on the, a positive place, say you're sitting in a room that you really, really like, all those other doors to the other rooms start to collapse. All of these other rooms start to collapse. So the only room that's left is the room that you're sitting in. And I thought it was the most brilliant analogy uh, for this. So really it is about changing what room? What room do you want to sit in? Um, you know, it will ultimately determine which rooms are going to start to collapse so that you end up with a, with a perceived reality of what it is that you're looking for. We're kind of going down the rabbit hole with the quantum quantum reality stuff. But, uh, but I, I think, I, th I think it's relevant. And, uh, you know, and I think the part of that person, you know, going back to this, this case and this email, the part of that person that you get to interact with is also going to depend on your vibrational state. Are you going to be interacting with the egoic negative part of them? Or are you going to be interacting with the pure positive energy that they now are in non-physical? Are you still interacting with the ego? Or are you interacting with something that is pure positive energy and inner being? What do you want to do? Um, there was a, 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 a really great case in um, a book called Hostage to the Devil. It was done by a, a Jesuit priest named Malachi Martin. Really great book. Um, if, you guys, if you guys have not read that book, I highly recommend it. It's, it's very interesting. You want to talk about like emotional states and crazy things happening. This is the book. Um, and it's, it, it is written by a Jesuit priest, so it's, it's religious in nature. So just you know, be aware of that before you pick it up. Um, but the cases are, are very intriguing. And, um, uh, the one case was about a fellow who, who believed he was just ultra spiritual and, uh, uh, and, and wasn't had a, had a lot of, of really crazy stuff going on in his experience and ended up, um, interacting with this entity that called itself tortoise and tortoise, uh, was all about patience because negative entities are funny. They tend to name themselves after uh, things they're doing <laughs> and they'll name, they'll name you after things, things you're doing too, which is, which is kind of funny. There was another case in the book where the entity called, uh, uh, had a, a nickname for the priest, which was uh, mushroom super. He never called the priest by his name. He always called him mushroom super because the guy was really famous for mushroom soup, but negative entities tend to do this all the time. They name after, um, they have no sense of ident real identity per se. They see themselves as a collective, so they name everybody after what they do. So anyway, uh, Tortoise was uh, uh, named itself Tortoise because it was so patient, and uh, it it was um, this this guy really believed that he could, I guess, you know, communicate with whatever, 
and he ended up communicating with this entity that slowly just slowly broke him down and it, it was it was really fascinating but his ego was so driven into into being this this kind of i guess ultra spiritual guru whatever um he didn't bother to clean up his stuff and he ended up in quite a mess with his entity but it was really interesting um so <laughs> shadow says she's very she's in trouble with what i'm named i don't know i think shadows are pretty important I think shadows are pretty important. I think, you know, I think without that, what do you, you can't know the light without the shadow. So you're kind of a crucial part of existence. I think that's <laughs> so anyway, I've got a great reading for you guys. This has been such an awesome conversation. I've got a great reading for you guys today from faith in the Valley, um, that I think you guys are going to find really useful. Um, and for those of you guys who are new, um, faith in the Valley is by, uh, Miss Ayan Love Van Zandt. Uh, and she's amazing. Uh, she's a life coach and a lawyer and a spiritual coach and a and just in, all around incredible human being and a priest, uh, uh, like a minister as well, which is pretty, pretty wicked. Um, so anyway, she wrote something that was really cool in this book and I had, I had to read it for you guys. So check this out. Some people are compelled by the theoretical desire to live a spiritual life. These people are curiosity seekers who will try a little of this and a little of that, never sticking to anything long enough to see if it actually works. Those who are theoretically spiritual read the books and know the language. They attend the workshops and they know what to do. However, in crisis, they will panic. In disappointment, they will criticize and condemn. In fear, they will lie. In anger, they become unforgiving and judgmental. You see, theory alone does no good. You must practice the principles order over and over to in order to realize the truth. The more consistent and devoted the practice, the greater the realization and demonstration of truth. Another telltale sign of a theoretical spiritualist is that they get full fairly quickly. They have forgiven enough. They're grateful enough. They've given enough praise. We must praise unceasingly. We must be grateful beyond measure. Isn't it interesting that those of us who have difficulty giving ourselves to one thing can measure when we have done enough of something else. I love that. I, I thought that was, I love that, love that, love that. Um, I, I think I think that is it's so important um, to, to realize and to understand that because when we get into, um, when we get into some of, some of the stuff, especially with a lot of what people are going through right now, um, I think when when people have, well, I think people have become very, very uh, uh, dependent on immediate results. And part of that is because of just our culture and, and where we are, um, you know, but they want these, these in, in insistent and instant immediate results. And we have to understand that there's a process to this. There's a process to everything. There's a process to, to the transition process of death. There's a process to, um, universal energy. There's a process to the laws of the universe. There's a process. Everything has got a process. And when we don't understand that we, or we get so far into a process and then it all, everything seems to, seems to fall apart or whatever, then we tend to decide that that process is either not working or it's broken. Um, just because our limited perspective cannot see the larger picture about what's going on. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people get, get, get stuck in, in, you know, the idea that, you know, our loved ones are stuck somewhere. They're, they're, you know, they must need our help to cross over because I haven't heard from them or I haven't whatever. And we forget that the universe has a process. It has a process for everything. And we are a part of that process, whether we want to be or not, we are a part of that process. It will have our way with us there. It's way with us, whether we like it to or not. And then we get to control the vibrational state and the reality in which we create and how it unfolds for us. But either way, there's a process. And I think we have to remember that, you know, wherever we are in the process, we have to be able to, to at least make peace with it and don't put in the resistance to just bog it all up because it, it'll, it'll really, it just, it just makes things worse. Um, Shadow's saying, um, as a society, we forget that we as a collective need time to acclimate to changes and time to achieve goals. Yeah, and, and people beat up on themselves so badly, so badly, 
because they have not reached a certain point at a certain time or they had an experience that they were supposed to have or they felt like they were supposed to have and they didn't have it so therefore everything must be going wrong or whatever crazy 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 um and that's just it's just not it's just not the case there is no time it's all about your alignment with what it is that you are wanting that's it there is no time um so here's here before we go here's a quick quick lesson from my python galen and i thought this was so brilliant so i bought galen a little advent calendar and it's got stickers so every day he has to pick a sticker and we put the sticker on the, the new date and um, Galen is my Python, for those of you guys who do not know Galen yet. Uh, hold on. Galen. For those of you guys who are, are new to Galen, there, ah, there he is, right there. There's Galen. Um, so every day he does this. He is like, he's a brilliant little guy. Um, and of course, it's an advent calendar, right? So you put the dates, you put the stickers on the dates. You know, in in order, we go one, two, three, four, five. So anyway, he put four. He we got to December the fourth, and we were supposed to put the next sticker on December the fifth. And what was so interesting about this was that he looked at December the fifth, and he was like, "No, I'm not going to put it there." And he looked over the whole calendar, and he pointed to the sixth. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. Well, don't you want to put it on the fifth? No put his nose on the six again so he put it on the six the next day he put his next sticker on the 22nd and left it looked at it and thought that was fine and went off to play and what was so interesting about this was that it was such a great reminder of the human constructs that we create in our heads because for us, we look at an advent calendar and you put the days in order. Well, there are no orders of days. There are there is no order of time. That doesn't that that's a human construct. He has no concept of that. To him, you know, it could be the 22nd, it could be the 5th, it could be the 2nd. It doesn't matter. We literally have this endless uh plethora of of time, space, reality and all of this. And when your mind's not cluttered up with some sort of order that you're supposed to do something in or an expectation that you're supposed to meet, you get to understand that time speeds up, time slows down. You know, it could, one day it's the 22nd, the next day it's the 5th. No, you know, we have, do we have time? We need time because otherwise we're going to miss a lot of appointments. Time makes our life reconcilable in our heads. Um, but it's, it's really a human construct. And I thought that was just so interesting that he was, he was picking these stickers. I don't know where he's going to put them tonight, but, um, I guarantee you it won't be on the fifth. <laughs> we won't even be on the ninth. We'll be, I don't know who knows. Um, but it, it was really cool. Um, and just sort of a neat reminder that it's like, you know what, you know, our process isn't, it's not the, it's not the universe's process. Calendars are the, are our process. It's not ours. It's not the universe's so anyway guys before we go um i we have to do some peace affirmations um go into our week strong so everybody take a breath i'm a channel of peace and well-being and my need for peace is abundantly met i unconditionally accept love and appreciate myself and who i am I recognize and am grateful for the abundance that is constantly flowing into my life, which I can choose to allow or not. I feel with every breath a sense of peace and love. I help others by maintaining and tending to my connection with source as much as possible. This well-being is accessible to me, even in a sea of uncertainty. And at this moment, all is well. I am able to liberate myself from my past and live with peace and serenity. I can see and appreciate all the beauty and abundance of the life around me. I am able to embrace love while letting go of fear. And I find peace with the soothing silence of my inner being. And everybody take a breath. Thank you guys for an awesome morning, awesome, awesome morning of spiritual health care. Um, I hope this made up for last week and me not being there last week because we're now at an hour, which is really good. Um, I hope you guys have a really good week going forward. Sally says she's missed me. I know I've missed you guys too. Um, as I say, next week, hopefully. <laughs> 
<laughs> Hopefully nothing's going to go crazy uh, this week. So we will do this again next Wednesday. Um, so anyway, you guys, so for those who uh, you know, have missed out on the classes before, um, EntitySeeker.ca as well as uh, YouTube.com slash EntitySeeker, you can find all of the spiritual healthcare classes as well as um, some of my live shows and fire videos and all sorts of things like that. Um, as well as if you go to SnakeAndPyre.com, um, you can see all my fire work and uh fire breathing and crazy crap that I my partner and I do with uh you know music and fire and all that stuff so anyway thank you guys again so so much thank you all for the happy birthday wishes <laughs> I got so many birthday wishes yesterday it was amazing so you got you guys thank you so much and uh I will see you guys uh next Wednesday all right <laughs> bye everybody <laughs>